Design for additive manufacturing goes beyond simply creating parts that can be 3D printed. True DFAM takes advantage of additive's unique benefits for things like customization, assembly consolidation, and lightweighting. There are simulation-based software tools that can help with this, but they're all a little bit different. They're designed to do different things. At the same time, there's also this very real human element to design that we can't ignore. I recently sat down with Eric Miller, the co-founder and principal of PADT, to talk about these issues and how to think about design within additive manufacturing. So in terms of optimizing the design, you know, we mm -hmm. talk about generative design, we talk about topology optimization, mm -hmm. and in your view, you know, what is the difference between those two? How, do we, how should we understand? So what topological optimization is saying is, I've got these loads and I'm gonna remove material in order to uh, minimize the amount of material that I have. And it's actually a fairly simple process of putting a load on, looking where the stresses are, where there's no stresses, reduce the stiffness and the, and the density, and keep doing that until you get holes and your part is gonna work. The, the big difference for me between generative and topological is generative gets into other ways of doing things. Um, we're starting to see people explore growing the part. So using, so one of the best um, generative design things in the world is organic systems plants. Mm -hmm. So, or your bones, right? Your bones have density based upon where load is. And that grows, it's not, they don't, it, material's not removed, it grows that way. So there's research going on in generative looking at how do we grow um, the part rather than remove material. Another area is we like to put these um, kind of lattice structures inside things. So what about optimizing that lattice structure to meet the loads? So instead of removing material, we're changing the shape and density and orientation of that lattice structure to get the optimal design. So generative is really, a, for me, is about generating a design that meets the requirements. And that includes the loads, it includes the cost, it includes manufacturing. So by putting all those things in there and, and, and then doing iterative simulation, to figure out what the optimal design is, is really what, what generative design is gonna be in the future. Can you think of an example where simulation saved time, effort, um, had some kind of benefit to an additive part that you were making? We have a couple customers that are designing parts, both in polymer and metal. Uh, and I'll talk about the, one of the polymer ones first. Um, it's, it's for a space application. Uh, it, was a, it was a typical AM uh, use case where they had a, a big assembly that was bolted and glued together and they turned it into one part that they did with AM. But they had issues with rigidity and vibration. And so they used simulation to go ahead and optimize that shape, find out where they needed to add thickness, where they could remove thickness, where they had to add, add ribs. And um, they used that to really optimize the part and get a, a well-built part. Out of, the, out of the process, and that's on the polymer side. On the metal side, we're seeing our aerospace customers um, start adopting it, um, not just to optimize the designs, so it's becoming almost standard um, for them to uh, use some topological optimization at least to guide them in their design. They may not go with the shape, but it kind of tells them which direction to go in. And then, and then go ahead and uh, verify the part uh, which is part of their normal simulation process. And we're starting to see one or two uh, really look at using it on the production side for figuring out how to get these parts out faster. We, we found that we can, we can do a part in one iteration. So we've got a little sample part that we do that's like a, just a T-shaped two cylinders that, that look like a T. And that's kind of our test part when we get any kind of a new machine in. And we were able to use simulation to get that part with no faults right out of the machine right away. So you said something interesting in talking about your customers mm -hmm. using topology optimization as a way of guiding their decisions, mm -hmm. not wholesale following right. the recommendations. So what's, what's the human component to this? Yeah, you know, I, I think someday we'll get there where, where the, the, we'll be able to use machine learning or something to look at a part and go, oh, that's not gonna work. Um, but you know, a lot of these design engineers have decades of experience, and they've failed before, right? They've got that, they built up that big data in their head, right? And they can look at a part and do pattern recognition and go, if I don't put a rib there, I know that part's gonna buckle. And that's something that because they didn't tell the computer to look for that, it didn't find it. Um, I think the other reason why is um, sometimes the parts just look too different. 
Is there an engineering reason not to do them? I, I, I don't know. It depends on part to part. But will customers adopt something that funky looking? The left side and the right side may be slightly different. And the customer will look at that and go, the end user will look at that and go, there's something wrong with that part. It's not made right. So we'll make the two sides symmetric, even though optimally one side doesn't need as much material. So those are the kind of things that we look at. Um, aesthetics plays an important role. 